Hello, this is Dr. Llewellyn Ison, and welcome to week three, or unit three, of our class on health and healing in Christian history. We're going to talk today about medical networks, specifically as they emerge within a monastic setting. So, last week you were introduced to some monastic models, um, and these were the primary monastic models. They are not the only monastic models. And as you recall, I introduced you to three. Uh, one is the Eremitic, so a hermit, an individual who largely is independent of um, a monastic community, but yet still linked in some way. A second model is Cenobitic, someone who lives in community, and this is the far more common form of monastic life. And then, of course, spiritual marriage, and that's where an individual will marry or be in some kind of living arrangement with another person, and they largely together live uh, a monastic life. So we talked last week about types of healing that are most often identified with hermits, so individuals who live on their own, like Amis and Kletika, whose, uh, whose acceptance of the sick role impacted both the way her body was viewed and uh, gave us an indication of her view of illness and its, and its function. And we also saw with the um, largely independent Theodore of Sicyon, that um, an eremitic ascetic um, could function as a healer as well. So what we're going to talk about today with medical networks is this category here of cenobitic monks. And we're going to take a look at how um, care for each other within a monastic setting is going to be really the best um, example or model of an early hospital. So. There are a variety of ascetic methods that are uh, part of living a monastic life. For many, if not all, individuals who adopt a monastic life, asceticism is part and parcel of that existence. Remember, asceticism is discipline, and so there are certain methods of discipline that a monastic must attend to in order to live in a religious community. One of the ascetic methods is that of isolation, and that can mean a couple different things. It might mean living as this um, Coptic monk here does, uh, independent of all other people and alone in a little cave monastery by himself. It might mean isolation like that, or it might mean isolation like this. You saw this image of Marsava last week as well in the lecture, and this is a monastery that is um, near uh, Bethlehem in Israel, and it is a massive structure. It's the size of a very, you know, like a small town or a large village, and you can see that clearly hundreds of monks can live there. Uh, but notice what's around it right? Not a lot. And so isolation doesn't mean by oneself, but it can, it can also mean together apart from the world, okay? But also, even if this were surrounded by city, okay, uh, the monastery itself is a form of isolation. I'm sitting right now uh, in my kitchen, in my house in Fircrest, Washington, and I am in many ways isolated from the world by virtue of choosing to be. And so isolation for a monastic can take a lot of different forms. And we can see this worldwide. Here in Washington, I've got for you a little Google search of monasteries, and you can see that even though we live in the 21st century in the Pacific Northwest of the United States that this Google search brought up all these monasteries, including the this one right here, the All Merciful Savior Orthodox Monastery on Vashon Island. And this is a Russian Orthodox community, and as I pull up images or as we discuss uh, different ascetic models and discipline, disciplinary practices that monks will engage in, I'll use a few examples from the, the Vashon Monastery, in part because it's a colorful, uh, clear example of the types of things that uh, the, the life in which monks engage, and also because they're my friends, and so I'm there a lot and I get to take cool pictures. 
So other ascetic methods include the habit. So the habit refers to the clothing that a person wears in a monastic life. And this uh, type of clothing will set them apart from other people. And you can see that um, the clothing um, within these different communities makes it clear where they are. So in this in this group of people here, these um, monastic figures, you have these are Roman Catholic women. And here we have an aspirant. This is someone who is thinking about being a nun. Um, here we have a postulant, someone who is um, has made the decision that she is uh, going to join the order if the order will have her. Um, and now this individual has been uh, tonsured as uh, a nun. And, but you can see she's a novice, so she's still fairly new at it. And here we have an individual who has made her vows and is, I don't know if it's proper to say a nun proper, but um, she has achieved a certain level that the aspirant here has not. And this is indicated by their clothing. Um, here we have some Greek Orthodox nuns. And here we have my, my friend Father Trifon, who is a Russian Orthodox monk. And uh, over here we have a Coptic monk. And you can see that, that their clothing is slightly different. And so the distinctions between the Russian Orthodox and the Coptic Orthodox or the Roman Catholic and the Greek Orthodox are clear by their clothing, the clothing that they wear that sets them apart. Other ascetic methods are food. It's wrong to think that uh, monks are just simply living on bread and water, and it's possible that there are places where that happens, but in most monasteries there is a very organized diet for monastic figures, um, and so food as an ascetic practice is very clear from the get-go. Remember that fasting doesn't mean not eating. Fasting is, simply means that one's diet is organized around one's religious life. So whether it is um, the period of Advent or the period of Lent or a period of Purim or a period of Ramadan, um, a monastic figure will engage in the ascetic practice of fasting, and so they will organize their diet around that particular um, religious holiday or religious uh, time period. Other ascetic methods include sleep, and it might seem like how is sleep something that is controlled or organized by monks? Um, remember that the key job of a monk uh, is actually the observance of the liturgy. So prayer is the primary function of a monastic's life. And so what this means is that in a 24-hour cycle, prayers are being said probably every three hours, which means that somebody is up at midnight and somebody is up at three and somebody is up at six. So in every monastery that I've ever spent some time in, I'm happy to say that naps are not optional. They are, in fact, requisite because everyone's sleep is being interrupted by the practice of prayer. And prayer is a form of ascesis. So for all monastic communities, um, again, life is organized around the process of prayer and the practice of prayer. It's the primary job of a monastic. And here you see this nun. Um, she is using this uh, to call the other monastic figures to, to the service and to the prayer. But what's kind of interesting is that in a monastery, even if somebody isn't there to um, pray with the person whose job it is to pray, nevertheless, the prayers happen anyway. A nice reminder that religious life is broader than simply the activity of any one person. Other forms of ascesis or ascetic methods include continence. So the control of one's body is certainly a part of uh, the life of a monastic. Continence is a word that I did not understand when I was first uh, learning about the history of religion. I always thought it had to do 
with being able to control your bladder, being continent or incontinent. And I think that's a common mistake. But in religious history and religious studies, it refers to sexual activity. It's a common mistake also to think that individuals who live in monasteries or who are monks or ascetics are people who hate sex or are afraid of it or have never had sex. Rather, monastics or ascetics are simply individuals who choose to live out their sexual life in a different way. Another ascetic method or um, discipline of monastics is, of course, the renunciation of their goods and their properties, either distributing their wealth and their possessions to members of their family and joining an order, or donating the things that they own um, or their possessions to the order Another ascetic method is that of obedience, and obedience, uh, I mean, we, this is a word we all know, we know what it means, but in the, in the circumstances of monastic life, it means that we all have a job to do, and you're not necessarily in charge, or you don't necessarily get to decide what job it is that you have to do. So in a monastery, there is, of course, a superior, an ama or an abba, a father or a mother, who determines what work needs to be done and by whom on any given day. So you might be charged with taking care of the, of the yard or harvesting, you might be working in the kitchen, you might be engaged in prayer, or you might be working with goats or a calf, or, this is what I want to do, work with mini ponies, and not just mini ponies, but look, baby mini ponies. I want that to be my job. Another ascetic method is that of hospitality. Monastic figures and monastic communities are required to accept uh, guests who come seeking solace or seeking companionship or a place to rest or even uh, just friends to talk with. Uh, here are my friends Father Trifon and Father Paul and Father Moses welcoming members of a Coptic Orthodox community uh, to the monastery. And then of course to get to our subject at hand, the form of ascesis that we're going to spend a little bit of time with is care for the ill.